My name is Andrew Slivker. I'm Chief Technology Officer with a company called Nivetech out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'll be talking about how um, Nivetech and its products extend desktop server technology with SOA governance and uh, runtime management. Uh, we've had a chance to present this product and technology on many occasions at Microsoft, so I'm not going to cover and decided not to go into, you know, high-level overview and details of the product and instead, you know, spend this a few you know, minutes just talking about a couple of new features in the product that has a direct relationship to the BSTOC server and gives uh, and extends it with, uh, you know, additional capabilities and uh, benefits. Uh, nevertheless, I'd like to start maybe with a little bit of introduction in Nivetech and its products. Uh, we are a software provider of middleware infrastructure uh, for Microsoft stack uh, to address uh, common challenges around this way, governance and runtime management of the integrational solutions. Uh, what's uh, unique to our uh, products is that uh, it's really a unified solution that runs both on premises, in the cloud, and in hybrid environments, and it's the only solution on the market today that is entirely built on the Microsoft stack itself. And as a result, not only it integrates diverse platforms, but it uh, integrates to the fullest extent with all Microsoft technologies, service technologies, and uh, supports pretty much all the capabilities that Microsoft offers, regardless whether they are interoperable or Microsoft specific. Uh, just from the high-level overview perspective, what the product uh, consists of and what it does, so it features central uh, Sentinet repository. That's repository of the organization's uh, services, effectively software assets. Uh, the assets that are managed through the repository are typically services, their versions, metadata, documentation, uh, life cycles, stages and management, uh, security policies, uh, uh, from runtime perspective, uh, the repository will store centrally and manage, you know, all the monitoring data, uh, service level agreements, alerting systems, and so on. Uh, so the repository is accessed by the Sentinet Management Services application, which is effectively back-end of the Sentinet infrastructure, uh, which is nothing else but a collection of uh, interoperable and secure uh, web services. So it's an API itself. So at the end of the day, we manage customer business services but our own infrastructure is all running on top of web services. There is nothing but web services. So the product is easily extendable with additional tools and a lot of our partners and customers do just like that. So uh, Sentinet users uh, using a rich uh, browser-based internet experience access repository, they register and maintain software assets within the repository, uh, manage their life cycle, you know, metadata, that kind of aspects. Uh, and uh, uh, that basically covers the design time governance part of the uh, product. From runtime perspective, we introduce what we call Sentinet nodes, where each node effectively you can think of as a gateway, a broker, pro specialized proxy that mediates communication between uh, consumers and uh, business service applications. So we've heard term uh, gateways today many times. This is just, you know, a specific example and implementation of a gateway, but the implementation that is natively, natively runs on Microsoft stack, it's built as a native .NET application. It actually runs inside the IS server system. It's uh, embedded into IS system as a host, as a container for Sentinet nodes, where each node is basically an application that can expose uh, any number of business services outside uh, presenting them as if they are uh, uh, presenting them as a virtual service. So we call them virtual because they uh, look like real services, behave like real services for the consumers. But at the end of the day, they are not because they're just, you know, Sentinet node just routes messages back to the uh, backend, syst uh, backend services. But in the course of routing messages, it enriches uh, communication with managed uh, security, access control, uh, authorization logic, uh, non-intrusive monitoring, service level agreements management, alerting, and so on. So that's a, a very high level kind of overview. Uh, on the next slide, it's, it looks a little bit messy, but I'll try to explain it. Uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, content, uh, context uh, that Sentinet considered for the BSTOC server. So let's start with the BSTOC server. Can, uh, imagine yourself that you have hundreds of web service uh, applications hosted inside the BSTOC server. So there might be uh, hundreds of uh, receive locations. Uh, by uh, using Sentinet, which might be, you know, entirely inside your organization's, you know, corporate networks, 
uh, where, where uh, BStock service is supposed to be consumed by external applications, maybe you know, Oracle, SAP, uh, Salesforce, maybe other .NET applications. Um, so all of these external applications might have different capabilities to uh, consume uh, BStock services. So each of the different BStock services has to be uh, adjusted to the capabilities of the client applications and security models have to be established that are appropriate to that sort of communications. Uh, with the virtualization, with the introduction on the Sentinet server, uh, Sentinet node, basically all hundreds of the received locations can be potentially uh, configured with the, the, with the same unified security and deployment model. So instead of uh, deploying you know, all of them in a variety of different ways and maybe even duplicating deployment of the same received locations with different adapters, you can just standardize on the way you deploy them, which would simplify uh, deployment and management and operation environment. And from that perspective, this is really just a business service that executes the business logic and all the uh, actual communication challenges are fully delegated to the node because communication between the node and the, uh, all these services can be again unified, but the exposure of these services to uh, uh, consumer applications can be configured remotely and dynamically using exact communication protocols and security models that are, needs to be imposed uh, on the external applications. And then interesting aspect, uh, having the same receive location or the, the same service, you can just open up another endpoint on, on exactly the same virtual service, or maybe create another virtual service. But even in the same virtual service, you can open up an, an, another endpoint and connect it immediately uh, to the Windows Azure through the relay service. You can still do that today with BStock server, right? Because we do have uh, available now WCF, uh, WS, HTTP relay adapters, net TCP relay adapters, but these are different adapters. So if you want to get this capability, you have to create a new receive location or reconfigure existing location and start managing it. Uh, and things like, um, uh, in order to put on Windows Azure, you have to uh, configure uh, 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 adapter itself with security keys associated with your account on Windows Azure. And now if you have hundreds of these locations, you have to start managing uh, you know, all these security keys. Uh, with virtualization, and again, this is just an example of the power that virtualization gives to the agility of the whole uh, you know, solution. Uh, you uh, configure just the node centrally, and again, it's remote and dynamic configuration with uh, uh, one or more of your Windows Azure accounts. Uh, they are configured with security keys that are stored centrally and securely behind the Sentinet node. They actually will be delivered remotely by the Sentinet backend infrastructure. And then at any time, you can take any of your existing service, doesn't matter what it, uh, what it runs on, what kind of transport protocol, and you can immediately connect it to the Windows Azure and manage that connection uh, you know, remotely and dynamically. Uh, another uh, you know, typical deployment scenario is that you might want to expose your services directly to the internet through DMZ. Again, you, you, you never deploy your BStock services in DMZ, right? But if you want to expose the services to the partners, you just place the, another Sentinet node in the DMZ, and now it becomes your gateway that protects and manages access to the underlying business service. So it provides initial authentication, authorization, access control, and monitoring at that particular point. And uh, just like you know, uh, virtualization is extremely uh, you know powerful concept uh, when you manage your services. It's it's the same level of benefits when you need to consume some other uh, web uh, services. So if BStock server application is now is a consumer of external services, again uh, there might be hundreds of send ports. Uh, you can configure them exactly the same way, maybe using you know internal Windows integrated Active Directory. Uh, security using the same type of adapter, maybe WS HTTP adapter, uh, and that will be the communication with the node, and then the node will mediate and broker that communication to external services using whatever protocol they require, whatever security models they require. It will be automatically ejecting identities that might be needed by external services because some service might require client certificate, another's username, password, another one requires Kerberos token. Uh, your BStock server deployment completely decoupled from that. They don't have to know about that. They don't have to be concerned about that. You just configure the node dynamically and remotely to inject all these type of identities. So that's a high level overview. So now I'd like to basically quickly cover a couple of uh, features that are new to the Sentinet product. And some of you guys I mean, in this audience already know the product. 
That's why I didn't want to cover it, you know, extensively. So the first feature I'm going to talk about uh, that we introduce in, pr uh, in the product is schema-first services. So typically when you start with uh, managing uh, business services uh, uh, in the repositories, on the registries, uh, you provide uh, some form of uh, standard metadata uh, that is imported into the repository, and that's how the service gets registered in the first place. So it might be Visdo for SOAP, Vedal or Swagger for REST. Uh, and uh, Sentinet actively promotes, and actually it's doing it from day one, the concept of uh, uh, immutable contracts. So the service contracts are immutable, uh, meaning that as soon as the service is registered, you cannot change the contract, you cannot change the data schema. You can change endpoints, their addresses, their security policies, but uh, when you describe your own business services, you don't change the schema. Because if you need to change schema, uh, you have to discipline yourself from the governance perspective, and you have to start creating new service versions. So that's why the product you know, enforces that kind of concept. But at the same time, uh, we've, uh, over the last you know, couple of years, we've received a lot of requests from customers to allow them to use the product in a situation when contracts are not actually immutable, uh, especially in a development environment when things might be changing quite fast, uh, you know, the schemas are not finalized, operations are not finalized, so the structure of the service is a little bit more flexible. So uh, they asked us to basically uh, provide the means to edit and modify service metadata and service structure effectively in place. So the operations of the services can be added, modified, removed, schemas may change, but what what comes out of all these changes is that repository should be still fully capable of emitting metadata that reflects that change. So the change needs to be done easily and fast, but the result of this change should affect immediately the metadata that's readily available uh, from the repository. And at the same time, and now we're coming a little bit closer to the BizTalk server, uh, some technologies, some environments like uh, BizTalk server technologies, they actually exercise the paradigm of schema-first services uh, in, in, the, in the process itself, you know, uh, by default. In fact, in BizTalk server environment, as you know, we always start from defining schemas, then we build orchestrations, then we decide how we want to expose them, put them as a service. So um, that's why, you know, in these cases, it, it might be that I don't have Visdal in the first place because I just created my, you know, schemas, I just... Uh, you know, expose them through my received locations, and now whether I get the schema, I, whereas uh, at the same time I need it. So that's why we introduced this schema first services approach that covers both bullet number two and number three. So you can either start with uh, Visdal uh, by registering service and then start modifying schemas any way you want, or you might actually start from the scratch and cre uh, start building a schema for your, uh, and Visdal of your, for your service right from the repository and the tool. Um, why is it important? Well, even though we do have BizTalk WCF Publishing Wizard, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of you might be you know, familiar with it and using it uh, in every day by building uh, you know, and exposing services, but, it, uh, but uh, this tool is, first of all, it's, uh, it, it has some limitation, its capabilities and how services can be published. And secondly, uh, it, uh, no matter what, it creates quite often some unnecessary artifacts. For example, uh, you might, uh, uh, if, if you're not publishing your service through uh, IIS server, but, uh, and even if you publish it through IIS server, but if you, even if you don't publish, like let's say you create a receive location that's configured with NetTCP transport, right? By running a publishing wizard, uh, you will get some uh, side artifact, which would be an endpoint hosted in, I, in local IIS server, and the only purpose of that endpoint existence is to emit metadata. It's not really a service endpoint. It's just an endpoint to get the metadata. So the whole exercise is done only for, the, for one purpose, to emit metadata. And that, of course, metadata and access to that met metadata is not centralized because it's some sort of you know, a local uh, artifact on the IIS server. So uh, that's why you know, repositories, from that perspective, provide ideal place and tool and instrument effectively, not only to centrally store and manage the, the metadata on behalf of all the services that are part of your BizTalk server solutions, but also as a tool that provides you with capability to uh, uh, describe your existing services from, meta, from uh, schemas in the first place and be able to modify it any way you need it. 
beyond the capabilities of what comes out of the box with uh, WCF publishing wizard. So uh, I talked about no central uh, uh, metadata sharing and management. And another good example would be uh, ESB toolkit. How many of you guys are familiar with ESB toolkit for BStock server? Right. So basically, in ASB toolkit, uh, it's it's very much typical that you might have a single uh, endpoint which is called on ramp service. Uh, it's typeless, so it has no knowledge of any uh, you know contracts. And yet, behind this on ramp service, there might be hundreds of real different services. So the question for uh, from the provider of the service, ASB toolkit is an excellent you know loosely coupled kind of infrastructure. But at the same time, the question becomes, where do I get all these uh, metadata that I need to give to my uh, customers that would be consuming my services through that single on-ramp service? Uh, again, if, if uh, we have some tool that provides schema-first services approach and provides with uh, easy experience uh, to describe my back-end big business services, uh, uh, it's their structure and uh, get access to their metadata, then uh, you know it will be much more easier for consumers to consume this service, even though they will be always accessing it through a single endpoint of the ESB toolkit itself. So uh, what I'd like to do is actually demonstrate a little bit of that feature. Okay, so I'm, not, I'm gonna log in into the Sentinet console. And on the left side, this is where you see the generic structure of the repository that's organized as an arbitrary collection of hierarchical folders where users of the product create these folders on their own. Uh, basically, they group together in the folder services and other uh, you know, artifacts any way uh, they want. Uh, whatever makes sense, you know, a, a folder might designate a particular project, solution, business partner. Again, whatever makes more sense for lo to logically group the services. So, uh, so that's the repository. Now let's take a look at the uh, BStock server. I have a very simple, you know, trivial, in fact, let me even show you. I have a very simple, uh, you know, orchestration that just, you know, takes request message, sends back response message, you know, by constructing it. And uh, it is deployed in a BStock server uh, immediately with NetTCP endpoint, with NetTCP transport. Uh, so the adapter is NetTCP adapter over here. And the orchestration is uh, uh, configured, you know, with the, with the receive port that, uh, receives messages uh, that will be processed by this location. So I do have my service, and typically I would, I would run now WCF Publishing Wizard in order to expose the metadata of that service and actually to, re to, to get access to, this, uh, to the metadata of this service. Again, by running WCF uh, uh, Publishing Wizard, I will, the, the wizard will create a, a sort of dummy endpoint somewhere on the side in IIS server, again, only for the purpose of WCF. Uh, uh, metadata. So instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start describing uh, my service in the repository, providing not only the central storage for, uh, uh, for, for man managing metadata, but also for capability to uh, modify that uh, metadata, uh, that WSDL, uh, any way I want, as, as, uh, you know, as we go with the modifications and possibly changes of the service itself. So in the uh, in the Visual Studio project solution, I obviously have, you know, some, I created some simple schemas for uh, search request, search response. They are in the same file under the same namespace, but my project might have, you know, hundreds of different schema files. And when I come to the uh, repositories, uh, what I'd like to do, I'd like to register my service. So I'm going to start with the registration of the service as a SOAP. Uh, this is where you would typically provide, you know, the WSDL to get the metadata, but we don't have it, so we say do not import service metadata. That would create for us empty service, which is considered as a container for service versions, because, you know, versioning, again, it's always an important aspect. So I'm going to call my service customer search. Uh, and I'm going to create a new version. 
So I'm going to say add new service version. Again, I can select to add service version from the metadata existing WSDL, or I can say design from schemas. And if I do that, now I can start you know, customizing my service. But before I do that, the first thing I want to do, I want to uh, put some schemas behind the service design. So these, are, these will be available resources behind the service design. So all I do, I'll just have to say upload schemas from files. So I navigate to my BizTalk server project where I have all these schema files. I can select you know, more, than more than one file. In this case, it's just one simple. I upload it, and all the schemas are here. So I can review it. So I save the schemas, and now I can continue with the design of my service. First of all, I can fully customize it. So I can provide new name, uh, you know, my, my own namespace for the service. I can rename the interface, uh, provide again, in, uh, rename the, in, uh, put my own namespace for interfaces. Uh, and then I can add new operation, and I can say, okay, add operation, and it's, let's say it's called search. And uh, you see it has a shape. Uh, of either request response or send uh, one-way operation, and you see how it changes, you know, with the requests and the responses. Uh, and then if I go to request, I have to select the uh, schema for the uh, request message. So I click select, and I see all the schema elements from all the schemas that I uploaded as a resources behind my service uh, definition. So I pick search, for example, for request. I go to response, pick search for response, and uh, the next thing I can do is just put the endpoint. Actually, before I do that, let me show you first of all. So here is where the differences start uh, populating compared with WCF Publishing Wizard because, again, this is not really a wizard. This is an editor. So you can come back and change things any way you want later without rerunning anything and republishing. Moreover, you can add things that might be uh, that are not available in publishing wizard. For example, you can assign your own SOAP fault, and now you can provide effectively design the service starting from schemas, right? Uh, that uh, provides you access to strongly typed uh, SOAP faults. Again, you can select, you know, from one of those schemas. But I don't have element for the fault, and, and, but you can populate and you know create a whole bunch of your own custom SOAP faults. Uh, similar thing with the headers. You can add a SOAP header. And again, describe the SOAP header in a strongly typed manner with its own schema. So uh, let me remove these guys. Uh, and uh, actually, at any point, you can save uh, your service structure, even if it's not complete, and request metadata. So it will be available at any point in your you know, design process. So uh, it doesn't have endpoint, it doesn't have any binding, but yet that might be already enough to build, for example, a proxy class. So you can use like add service reference experience in Visual Studio and your proxy class is all built and you can probably add endpoint later if you want to. But at the same time, you can continue you know, describing exact our service and you can say add endpoint and now all you have to do is just you know, copy the information from the, uh, uh, from the receive location. So uh, this is the NetTCP adapter configuration. That's the address of the endpoint. So I come back, come, come back to the repository. I say, this is my NetTCP endpoint. And now I have to provide it with security policy. Now, we do know that uh, we've configured that particular adapter with the WCF NetTCP uh, 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 transport. So we do exactly the same symmetrical action. And that's where, you know, the uh, nat nativity of the product, you know, comes into play in terms of uh, native support for Microsoft uh, environment because they even speak the same language. So I go to the policies and then I can select the policy which are also stored in the repository and users actually create and populate them uh, in the repository as a uh, kind of templatized uh, WCF, standard WCF configurations. So I can pick uh, NetTCP, uh, you know, Binding, for example, I can even see how it looks in terms of configuration, assign it, and I'm done. So at this point, again, I can request metadata, and now it have all the bindings on the security policies, all the endpoint. So, uh, so from practical perspective, as an example, uh, one of our partners, uh, service integrator, uh, the, the company in Turkey called uh, CVS Bill G., uh, it's one of the premier uh, Microsoft integrators in Turkey. Uh, they are building quite massive uh, integrational solution for one of the major Turkish banks, and they're highly leveraging ASB 
uh, toolkit infrastructure. So uh, uh, leveraging Sentinet, they, uh, I mean, they actually started even the, at the initial stages with about a couple of dozen services and the number grows exponentially. So leveraging this tool, not only they can collaborate uh, metadata of the services that comprise the, the ESB solution, but also they don't have any more uh, deal with uh, artificial artifacts that are created by WCF Publishing Wizard and they can use this tool to manage effectively uh, the metadata and describe it to the fullest extent possible. Okay, so that's that's one feature that I wanted to talk about. And then the other feature I wanted to talk about is integration with actually ESB toolkit itself. That's the direct integration between the Sentinet product and Bistock server. Again, in general, our product is uh, kind of service environment agnostic, so we can manage any services, SOAP, REST, uh, Microsoft, WCF services, uh, BSTOC services, non-Microsoft services. Uh, this particular feature presents a specific integration with BSTOC server itself. So we've talked about uh, BSTOC uh, ASB toolkit and uh, one of uh, its capabilities, which is by itself, again, is a, a, a kind of set of libraries and tools to uh, support Microsoft with BSTOC server extended actually with support for uh, loosely coupled dynamic uh, and uh, 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 dynamic and lo loosely coupled messages routing mechanism. Uh, part of the BSTOC server is the endpoint resolution uh, mechanics or component uh, that is uh, available today with the BSTOC. Uh, uh, ESB toolkit uh, uh, with integration with Microsoft UDDI registry. But as you probably know, UDDI registry is about to be uh, decommissioned. At least there will be no any future development in this direction. It will be supported by BSTOC, but it was announced that it's basically frozen. And it's, there is a good uh, reason for that because it's really limited kind of uh, registry. It doesn't really have a lot of capabilities. It's difficult to deal with. Uh, so it was uh, very much natural uh, for Nivatech to offer Sentinet as a much more comprehensive repository that would uh, provide uh, ESB toolkit with integration with that repository where uh, endpoints can be dynamically resolved through the Sentinet resolver. So basically what we've done, we've developed uh, a uh, ESB toolkit resolver uh, that uh, is integrated with Sentinet and uh, dynamically at runtime uh, itineraries can, can be configured with search criteria for the endpoints in the Sentinet repository. They can uh, find these endpoints, find their addresses, find security policies, and uh, the toolkit will dynamically build the dynamic off-ramp send ports to send messages and route them dynamically to the, uh, uh, to the services that are described in the repository. So again, I'm gonna quickly show you uh, the demo, very brief demo. So, so uh, basically, I'll probably start with the service. So I have a service, business service that's registered in the repository. Again, it's called customer search service. So it has some endpoints. Uh, the endpoint has some attachments. Uh, it has the my ESB endpoint keyword attached to it or tag. I hear it, oops, where am I at the endpoint level? Yeah, so it has a tag attached to it. And uh, uh, my intent will be to configure itinerary with a reference to that endpoint in the repository so that at runtime ESB toolkit uh, would be able to find this endpoint based on this keyword and dynamically configure itself for dynamic message routing. So uh, as you know, uh, resolvers uh, typically provide integration with Visual Studio and that's certainly true for Sentinet. So what I have here is a very simple kind of trivial itinerary that is configured with a uh, route message, uh, message extender and the resolved service endpoint thing. And then if you, if you click on the resolver itself, you will see that it is configured with Sentinet resolver extension so that, oops. Must be here, yeah, right here. 
So the sentinet resolver extension uh, appears in the designer uh, uh, surface of the Visual Studio as soon as you install uh, the, this component from sentinet. And when you configure your resolver with sentinet extension, you are uh, given a choice of multiple different search criteria. So this is where it is highly more flexible uh, compared to simple UDDI registry. This is where you can specify uh, your endpoint, path to the service through the repository, you know, through the folders. So in other words, I, I need to find an endpoint of the service that's located in that particular folder. Uh, you can pro narrow down to version ID, service version number, and so on. So you can combine all these different criteria together, or you, like in this case, I'm just providing my ESB uh, endpoint keyword, uh, and uh, the, the resolver at runtime uh, is supposed to find this endpoint by that key name, and of course the itinerary doesn't know anything about the actual endpoint address, what kind of uh, you know, security and protocol will be used. It will all be resolved dynamically at runtime. What's nice about uh, the plug plugin, uh, Sentinet plugin for Visual Studio is that it also has a testing capability. So you can select test resolver configuration before you actually start sending any uh, messages through the uh, itinerary, so you can quickly validate that the search criteria that you provide really resolves the endpoint that you are uh, looking to resolve uh, through the repository. So I can quickly test, click test uh, resolve the repository, and then in the output window, uh, you will see that this is where I can, this is where I can see Sentinet resolver test results, and you can see a collection of all these name value uh, properties that uh, resolver returns to, to the ESB toolkit because ESB toolkit is, is actually expecting just this collection, nothing else. Based on that collection of, of properties, it will start building dynamic endpoint. And you will find that in this dynamic endpoint, you see the address that was resolved, you see the type of adapter that BizTalk will be using. In this case, it's custom, WCF custom adapter. Uh, you will see elements that describe an XML, the binding configuration, and so on. Uh, and what's more important, at the end, uh, at the end of the uh, output print, uh, uh, the printed output, you can see actually information, additional information that are not uh, that itinerary itself and toolkit is not concerned about. But as a developer, you want to make sure that uh, the criteria that you provided really uh, resolve the endpoint you intended to resolve, but not some other endpoint. So it shows, you know, the path to the service that this endpoint corresponds to, service ID, version number, endpoint name, and endpoint address. Okay, then I'm gonna skip sending any messages and giving any demos, and instead what I'm gonna really quickly show you is just another demo, interesting demo. Yeah, if you if you'd like to learn more about that, you can find a, a, a documentation published on Microsoft MSDN about extending BizTalk with Sentinet. Bistock Toolkit with Sentinet Resolver. Uh, what I'd really like to show you is quickly is an interesting kind of demo sample use case that again highlights the, the, the power of service virtualization itself. And at the same time, it shows how it can extend Bistock server capabilities uh, with additional, you know, uh, with additional capabilities. So uh, I might have a service that again is uh, consumed internally by some internal, uh, internal application. Uh, and then it, it might be actually a SOAP service. In this case, I will make it a SOAP service and I will make it net TCP uh, uh, service. And then my intent will be to put this service on Windows Azure, expose it to a mobile application, expose it as a REST service, and expose it through a Windows Azure service bus. In fact, today you can do that out of the box with, with BizTalk server simply because even though BizTalk server does have uh, uh, web HTTP adapter that allows you know to expose services as REST, but there is no web HTTP relay adapter, so you can do that, but you can't do it through service bus. If it is SOAP service, then yes, you do have WCF HTTP relay adapters and net TCP relay adapters, but if it's REST, you can combine together REST and uh, Win Windows Azure service bus. So what I'd like to show you again how really quickly you can uh, take your existing service running as .NET uh, net TCP uh, SOAP service and expose it as REST API in a matter of few seconds. Again, in a lack of time, I'm not gonna go through the whole process. 
I'm just going to show you the end result. So I have this uh, uh, BSTOC customer search service actually in its second version. And it's, you see it's deployed with NetTCP. It's SOAP service. And I also virtualized it as a REST service. Uh, I'll show you. This, was, this is actually the designer service surface uh, of the virtual services. The process is really simple. You just take the service that you want to virtualize and drag and drop it here. And as soon as you do that, that's the picture that you will see. And then uh, when going to operations, uh, you basically uh, click generate template message, and Sentinet will generate you a sample of the SOAP body uh, 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 message that a business service is expecting because it is SOAP service. Uh, and all you have to do is just parameterize uh, XML elements in that template and expose these parameters through the syntax of your REST API. Moreover, in this case, I actually exposed, uh, you see there are two uh, elements, first name and last name in, uh, in the SOAP message. That's what expected. But I also uh, introduced another query parameter that's called security key. So not only I want to expose my SOAP service as a REST API, but I also want to add RESTish kind of security on top of that RESTful API and add security which is completely different to the security of my SOAP service. So that's all I did. And if I go to the summary, this is my REST service that I can see. This is the operation of my REST service. It is described through this URI template. And this is the actually the, uh, end, the endpoint on the service bus. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, one, one more thing quickly. How do I expose it to service bus? I've basically taken one of the Sentinet nodes registered in the repository, and I also did drag and drop on the inbound endpoint surface. This is how I created an endpoint for the, uh, for the virtual service. And when I was creating the endpoint, I selected from the drop-down list my service bus namespace that the node is configured with. Because remember, it's a one-time experience. You configure your node with the knowledge of your service bus namespaces and security keys. So I don't have to provide and manage any security keys associated with my Windows Azure service bus namespaces. They're already configured behind the Sentinet node. And all I have to do is just you know, give some relative address to distinguish that service on the service bus from maybe some other service bus. So I'm going to go to the summary screen of the virtual service. Now, that's what is exposed to consumer. Uh, copy the address, and I'm going to use the browser just you know, to test my service. So I'm going to stick it in the browser, provide for the first name, let's say, Andrew Slivker. And for the key, I'm going to say key one, because I know that this Sentinel also provides managed access control. So there is a set of security keys that I provisioned. I'm skipping that part uh, that would allow access to the REST service and ultimately to the uh, backend business service. So I click load and I get back result from the service. So th this, is, this URL is actually, uh, where is it? Oh, I closed it. Ah. Anyway, I can do it again with just a key. OK, that's another one. Uh, if I try, let's say, key two, it will also work because access rule says you know, that it is allowed. But if I try key three, I got uh, 403 forbidden. This is how, again, I'm demonstrating that there is an additional access control management added on top of the virtual service. So very simple example. It takes only a you know, few seconds to expose your BSTOC server service outside through uh, Windows Azure uh, service bus as a REST API. And most importantly, I didn't touch my BSTOC server during the whole presentation. I don't modify it. It's one-time experience. I deployed it. That's it. So that's pretty much it. Uh, 